Hello folks and welcome to today's show, myself, Michael Verney, uh, beside me here as well, and John Mahan who's joining us as well. John, how are things? Good, good, yeah, live from Castle Bar, beautiful morning down the <laughs> west here. And Verney, where are you going from? Are you from Mead today? I'm from Mead, yeah, We're, we've, uh, we've three different counties, yeah, going Dublin, Mead and Mayo, yeah, so we've uh, three different uh, Three different ideas of maybe how those counties will get on in the in the league as well. So lots lots to talk about. I tell you one thing I wanted to put to you, John, as well though, as a manager, just wondering what you what you make of the, the situation with Glenn and Kilmaco Crokes at the moment. Uh if you were involved or just say if you were Maliki O'Rourke, what what would what would you be doing? Yeah, I have to say um it's the most difficult and contentious issue that the GA have been fi- uh, faced with in quite a while. I thought Maliki O'Rourke uh, um, spoke very well, and I know he was speaking in a, pers- a personal capacity immediately after the final whistle. And I think he uh, he, he understood that um, you know what your Graham's were beaten fair and square. Uh, I think uh, in hindsight, obviously when he went back and reviewed it, and particularly the positioning of that 16th man, we leave the 17th man out of the equation because I don't think Paul Mannion had any influence on the outcome of the game. It's a complex one. I can understand why uh, Glenn might have uh, loved Crow Park to have intervened and taken control of the situation. And I know there's three uh, options available to them. I, 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 I have to say, I'm torn. Last night I was reviewing and reading some uh, alternative uh, you know, opinions that I had myself early on. I thought initially, immediately after the final, end of story, the game is over. On, it's, look, it's totally different to uh, what happened uh, a number of years ago between May and Dublin when Robbie Henley was forced to retake the 45. That happened during the 70-minute game scenario. And I can understand, had um, the referee on um, uh, at the weekend become aware that uh, there was 16 men on the pitch during the game, he could have very easily have allowed the 45 uh, to be retaken. I honestly don't know. I think it'll drag on and on and on. Uh, I hear Shane Walsh was due to fly out to Australia yesterday morning. I'm not quite sure how he's gone. Uh, this thing could be played, replayed on, on the in St. Patrick's Day because obviously the t- we won't have time. And uh, obviously they were hoping a quick solution might have been to play it uh, before the National League game this weekend on Saturday in Court Park. That's obviously not going to happen. But. Uh, I haven't given you a, a, a clean answer. What's, what's the right solution? There are no, there, there are no clean answers, and that's the thing. You see, and it was my opinion would have been the same. We were on Monday morning. I thought it was kind of done and dusted. Then, really, I thought even after Ma- what Maliki said, I, but then it's almost like I don't know. The public swell of support has built up for Glenn now, uh, and it's yeah. almost like I, I don't know. If they were in a way, I think they were kind of left with no choice but to but to lodge an appeal in 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 many ways because. Uh, and I suppose it has a lot to do with the personalities involved in the club as well. Some people would look at it quite cold and calculated and say, no, the 16th man on the pitch, that's it. And then other people might say, oh, we were we were beaten on the day. Uh, we'll take our medicine or whatever. And it's, it's a lot to do with the, the characters involved. There's definitely been a public swell of support in the days that followed. Well, what is highlighted again is we, our sideline and our fourth officials and our, uh, and our linesmen have become a little bit lax. There was a time when you have an incursion onto the pitch, a manager or a mere friend or a, a water boy or something back in the day, put a yard onto the pitch, there was somebody you know, catching you by the throat, forcing you back. I can understand it was a little bit chaotic there in the last minute or two. There was a little bit of gamesmanship, understandably, by Kill McCudd trying to uh, wind the clock down. You know, I, I think a sub, a referee ordinarily allows 30 seconds for a substitute. That wasn't taken into the equation. There could have been another minute added on um, which might have influenced uh, that 45, what the kicker might have gone for. He might have kicked it over the bar, hope maybe to win a kick out and maybe go for a, for a draw. So there's a, a myriad of issues here. But what we will see, unfortunately, is you now are going to have fourth officials who are going to be absolutely enforcing the regulations and rule. And it was that way pre-COVID. I mean, you know, the sub had to come off the pitch uh, the, the player had come up before the sub went on. That was very, very rigidly enforced. 
right now it had become a little bit lax. So I, I, I'm not apportioning blame on anyone. It was just a sequence of events here. And fortunately for the referee, he's in the spotlight. He, I'm sure he's feeling very, very guilty. It was a genuine mistake. Is a, 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 There'll be an asterisk over this All-Ireland uh, uh, club uh, title anyway. Right now, I'm sure Kilma could where you'll there'll be lots of guys saying, well, look at you, did you win it fairly? So maybe they might be anxious enough to go and, and have a replay and let the best team win. I don't know. It's, 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 it's an interesting one. It's a talking point for sure. Um, do you know, I was just wondering uh, your thoughts, John, on the pre-season competitions, because obviously we saw the likes of Louth not fulfilling the fixture, Offaly not fulfilling fixtures, and that was in the O'Byrne Cup. And now Wexford and Galway, they were due to play in the Walsh Cup final, but they've instead yeah. decided to absorb it into their first league fixture. And I'm just wondering... Are these preseason competitions a waste of valuable calendar space that we don't have? Like, should the should it be kept for college competitions? Or what are your thoughts, having managed Offaly the last couple of years? Yeah, and like I mean, I've also managed uh, um, in UI Goa, um, um, and I'm, I'm a great fan and supporter of six competitions. Therein lies the issue. I think the fact that we're squeezing in six of right now. I think there were some wonderful games last night. UCC and uh, Georgetown, UCD all playing. Uh, and so I'm a great supporter of college football and the Six and Cup campaign. Unfortunately, the timing is wrong because I know, I think, in obvious situation, there were 13 players already there after the controversy um, in, in relation to the, the, that loud fixture. Um, I'm a fan of, 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 pre, um, uh, of these um, FBD, McGrath Cup, McKenna Cups. I, I am a fan of them. I support them because it's a fantastic opportunity to go out and look at blood from new, fresh faces that you might have brought into your squad. Training is wonderful, there's no question about that, but you learn so much more from a competitive game. And I'm sure, uh, you know, a lot of the games are played, particularly with a little bit of rivalry. I know Mayo and Galway uh, playing here a couple of weeks ago in the FPT League. Wonderful uh, um, <clears throat> excitement building into an FPT game, in the, albeit in the Dome. And, uh, you know, a lot of people talking about it and wondering. And, you know, I'm a fan, I'm a supporter. Notwithstanding the whole issues that arose, particularly... Uh, in the Auburn Cup up in Leinster. That one in particular became a little bit farcical and uh, certainly something has got to be addressed. But I would be all for retaining it. I would. I think we've got to, uh, Crow Park have got to take a look at the timing of the Six and Cup for sure because uh, a lot of a lot of pressure on young fellas. And we saw the scenario last year with Jack O'Connor, uh, I think it was the McGrath Cup game, forcing two boys, I think they had tugged out for UL to come back down and play after having played Sigerson. Not the right thing. We're talking about player welfare. So there's a myriad of issues there. But for me, I was always a fan of those uh, pre-league uh, competitions, McGrath Cup, McKenna Cups, whatever. And I know I might come right back um, when I was involved in Clare in the early 90s. Um, we, we had that competition for us uh, and was fantastic. It just got a little bit of momentum going, get a, a little bit of a taste of what it's like. You know, even to manage, uh, you know, players to get their timing right for a 70-minute game. There's a huge myriad of issues there pre-league because the league now has become so critical and so important. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, Mayo will have certainly learned a fair bit about some of their new fresh faces that they've brought into the squad by participating and winning the FPD here in Connacht. So when you mention uh, like your early or your early days with Clare back, I suppose you know in the early nineties, do you remember like your first few weeks as a senior intercounty manager, or even building into that first competitive game? I certainly do. It was a lonely place, uh, I can assure you, because there's quite a few of my friends uh, who thought I was absolutely stone mad going down taking on a Clare team. <laughs> I was living in in, in Galway City at the time, working in Custom Barracks, and that was in the army. And uh, it was a pretty hectic, um, hectic at the time because I was commuting from Galway City into Athlone for work and then down to West Clare and Berbley or down to Crochine to train. It was a lonely place. I can tell you it was a lonely uh, place for me. But uh, Clare at the time were a little bit chaotic. They were, I, I had uh, played against them. Mayo had played Clare in a couple of challenge games over the previous number of years. And I always recognised they had damn good footballers. But they just had taken their eye off the ball a little bit. I think they had played... Um, uh, I think an all B uh, match against Sligo a couple of weeks prior to me to getting involved and we couldn't get 15 players on the pitch. So it was, I suppose, for, it was a starting off at a very, very low base. The only way you could go is up if you got a little bit of organisation into it. And what I discovered early on, there was an awful lot of very, very talented footballers in the squad that just needed a, lot, a little bit of direction and guidance and a little bit of hard work. But uh, I remember it for a combination of reasons, but I do recall the importance of getting just any kind of a game. I, I actually targeted a number of club teams and college teams that I thought we might 
beat with the hope of ben, building a little bit of confidence in the squad. And we did that uh, and very successfully because uh, we did get a bit of momentum going and you know, we saw an incremental improvement and an incremental improvement in our standards and in the confidence of the squad at the time. It's funny you should say that. It's not all about playing games, even practice games, where you're going to get this unbelievable competition. Sometimes, particularly with a team that's at not necessarily a low end, but if confidence is low, you, you do need a few morale boosters, even three or four challenge game wins. And I do think, like, a lot of managers do that. They think, you know, are we maybe three or four points better than this crew? Could we, you know, could we get a win under our beds? Could we? Because that's worth two or three points to you then the next day you go out probably. Uh, well, exactly, Mike. That's the point I'm making. I mean, as, as I say, back in 1990, when I took over that clear squad, I very deliberately targeted what I perceived to be weaker teams, just to get a bit of confidence going, a bit of momentum going. And it was building blocks for the future. And, you know, I, I recall being beaten by Kerry in the 1991 uh, Mustard Championship, and I recognise we were more or less toe-to-toe -to -toe with that team for about 50, 55 minutes. It was only the last 15 minutes or 20 minutes where our fitness levels were not near as good as Kerry on that occasion. And it was a question of building on that. So look at in, in this game, every day is a school day and, uh, <laughs> uh, and you learn as you go along. And even in latter stages in, involved in inter-county management, like, I mean, there's so much you can learn about managing teams and managing squads. And uh, it's not an exact science, but, uh, you know, you lean on, on, on smarter guys to, learn a few tricks of the trade as you go along. So it's, a, it's an interesting space. And it's an interesting space. I think I, I think there are 18 or 19 new inter-county managers coming into this National League. I tell you, you know, a lot of them are sweating bullets because there's huge pressure involved now in, at inter-county level. And uh, not to the same extent as it was when I started off 32 years ago. But right now, every inter-county manager, whether it's Division One or Division Four, it's this huge, huge pressure. It is... Uh, it's certainly going to be a hotbed uh, of, um, well, entertainment, but also just to, to watch how player, uh, how managers deal with the pressure that's going to come their way in the next couple of weeks. Michael, it's interesting, like, the, to some people, the league means everything, and John can, I'm sure, speak to that. But to others, it, it almost feels like they're just going through the motions and just targeting the championship. Yeah, it's yeah, a funny but... one. Like, if you look at, uh, and I bring in John now on this, if you look at Kerry last year, Kerry definitely targeted the league because I think Jack O'Connor wanted to hit the ground running. Uh, you look at it this year, like Kerry are, I think, short short 10 starters, I think, yeah. for the started league. You probably won't. I don't know when you'll see David Clifford in the league. I don't know when you'll see uh, Pawdy, Pawdy. Pawdy Clifford as well. Like, they're, you know, and look at what those two players would, would take away from, from Kerry. So it's kind of funny what we mentioned there about managers wanting different things, even I'm thinking of like when Pat Gilroy took over the dubs, didn't they play like Monaghan every second week to try and, he was trying to toughen up his squad. But when you know your squad, maybe like Jack O'Connor does now, there'd be an awful lot. I'd say I'd say a mid-table finished for, for Kerry and they'd probably kind of be happy enough because he kind of knows what he has. And I think having everybody in tow and fit for maybe the last two rounds of league and then fly they they can kind of ease themselves into Munster and ease themselves into the championship. What do you think, John, about like it is it's different it's different strokes for different folks going into well, the league kind of isn't 100%. it? percent I mean the pressure this year uh is on say Div division two teams because as we know Westmead are going to be accommodated playing out of division three in the Sam Maguire having won the College of Cup last year. We're going to have a Sligo or a Leitrim who are going to be playing for Sam Maguire, Division Four, Division Four teams. So there's um, two, possibly two teams in Division Two who are going to lose out to Sam Maguire. So straight away, Division Two is going to become it'll be helter skelter because you know winning uh, maybe uh, three games uh, heretofore would have guaranteed you survival in Division Two. Right now, if you're down in uh, position number seven and number eight. The chances are you won't be playing for Sam Maguire. That's just an example of what's going to happen in Division 2. Division 3 and Division 4 teams, ordinarily, with the exception of Tipperary and Cavan uh, winning the, uh, we call them the COVID uh, uh, provincial titles a couple of years ago. But uh, for, the, for the likes of Division 3 and Division 4 teams, the only chance of success they really have is winning a, a league title, a Division 4 or a Division 3. Because more often than not, they're not going to win a provincial championship. So their only chance to medal and to get that feel good factor associated with winning um, a title is div a league title and get to play in Crow Park and the excitement that that'll generate. And 
you know, that's what I've discovered in, 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 through my time in Offaly. Like, I mean, you can't stand in front of the group and say, lads, we're going to win an All Ireland and we're going to win an, a, a Linster title because that's unrealistic. They'd, they'd laugh at you. So, what do you focus on? You try and focus on getting promotion and, and trying to generate the feel good factor because this is a lifestyle choice that those players are making. And the buy in is, is incredible from every team, every inter county footballer. Like, I mean, the lifestyle that's involved. And as I say, it's a huge demand. On your own social time and everything so you want to make it as enjoyable as possible for them so go out and get hammered every single weekend it certainly ain't fun and if you're trying to impress the girlfriend back in your hometown and you're coming home <laughs> coming home on a sunday evening after another 20 point defeat well you won't you won't survive <laughs> can i just ask you john quickly did your message have to change to when you stood in front of the clare players in 1990 compared to when you stood in front of the offley players in 2022 i i i, I, I don't know how to word this right but do are is it less uh, is it more um is it harder now to like not spoof players if you know what i mean but to, fi to fill them with that message of you know we you're a spoofer out. john no no like, no, but you, no but you know you know what i mean though as in players just want like if if, the, if you say you no know, with due respect and i'm an awfully man myself if you say lads we can win in all ireland like it, you know it's not realistic whereas you know if you said that 30 years ago it, maybe it is a bit more. Do you, do you get kind of what I'm saying? Well, sure, look, at, I mean, Clare proved it. Leitrim proved it in 1994 by winning a provincial title. Clare proved it by winning that uh, provincial title. Right now, the chances of that happening are very, very, very slim. Because the reality is, you have, I mean, those top tier teams have just gone so far ahead of others. Like, I mean, and that's the reality. You see the likes of Armagh, who are a very, very exciting young team. I mean, if they don't come along and win a provincial title or do something exciting in 2023, well, there's a question mark over that, you know, that whole exercise, six, seven years, uh, you know, under, uh, under uh, McGinney, what have they achieved? So the pressure on the likes of the Armas to deliver, and I'm talking about a very, very exciting team, one of the best games of the year last year was themselves in Galway, above in Court Park. So... Division three and division four teams, realistically, the Leitrims and the Clares who pulled off. Now, Clare, an exception, they've done remarkably well. When we talk about National League, to me, though, what, what, what Podge Collins has done down there, um, Podge's dad has done Colum, down there, yeah. has, Colum, has been absolutely remarkable. And they're, they're, they're the real success story of how they've sustained their division two status, I think, going into the ninth season. But, I mean, it has changed because the standard at the top, the gap has widened. I mean... You know, the Leitrims are not going to win a provincial title. Now with Galway Mayo driving forward with the kind of momentum they have right now. So that, that has certainly changed in the last 30 years for sure. And speaking of Galway and Mayo, they meet this weekend, Kevin McStay's first proper match, I suppose. And mm -hmm. when we spoke before Christmas, we kind of talked about, how, you know, there was all the distractions, all the, you know, the big names that were in the background. We obviously have Lee Keegan gone, Oshin Mullen gone. And like now it's time for the actual football. What are you expecting from Mayo this weekend? Well, you know, funny enough, when we were talking about the pre-season competitions there earlier on, the FBD League uh, um, encounter above in the Dome a couple of weeks ago certainly has a bearing because I know uh, going into that game, everybody had huge question marks over Mayo. They're a team in transition. You know, over the last 10, 12, 14 years, Mayo have built their success and their foundation of the success on tight man-marking athletic defenders. They're all gone. Colin Boyle, Keith Higgins... You know, uh, Lee, Roy, Lee Keegan, Oshin Mullen, Chris Barrett, Donny Bohan, Jerk Harfagy, all gone. So that was our platform. Of course, we have Paddy Druckett still there who had gives us that drive and momentum. But there's huge pressure on one or two guys now. So there's a huge question mark over Mayo. But notwithstanding what I've just said there in relation to the pressure, that FBD game encounter, I know a couple of uh, guys who went back to Galway scratching their head and said, my God, you know, uh, um, Mayo are not that bad. I feel here, as we get closer to Saturday's game, now Shane Walsh is not obviously going to be playing. I don't know what the story is with the Sigerson boys, Matthew Tierney and the Kellys from, um, uh, from Mike Cullen, who are playing with uh, NUI Galway. So I'm not sure if they're available. But right now, there's a bit of a shift. I think the odds reflect that. People are getting more and more confident uh, that uh, Mayo will pull off a, game, um, a result here in Casa Bar. I'm expecting maybe 12,000 people here on Saturday evening. The weather is good. Huge appetite for football. That's the way the league has gone. A couple of years ago, you know, you, you, you might have three, four thousand at a, a game of that na nature. Right now, there's great interest, live TV. It's the big game of the weekend. 
I'm expecting a male a male victory, a, a close one, um, particularly without Shane Walsh and, as I said, question marks about a few others. I think uh, uh, Porek uh, Joyce has a number of uh, of um, injuries in this camp as well. Mayo have a young team, huge. We're talking about pressure, big pressure on that Mayo management team. Like I mean, you know, I recall a number of years ago uh, watching the standing um, in Hogan Stand, looking at I think I counted fourteen in the backroom team. Uh, with the Dublin squad at the time, and I was just shaking my head, saying, "Where is this? Where is this going?" I think right now we have 22 or 23 involved in the backroom team with Mayo. They've doubled up on physios, they've doubled up on strength and conditioning, doubled up on medical staff. The resources are enormous. I mean, and to put that package together has, well, I, I, I dare I say, it, it's cost a lot of money because of even expenses alone. So there's huge pressure on Kevin. He wanted the job desperately. I think, uh, you know, will we contest uh, Mayo, that is, for an All-Ireland title this year? I don't think so. But certainly this is a year where they, he will be hoping for a very, very good league. Hopefully, um, uh, I mean, a provincial title and maybe a good run uh, into the top eight and building for the future. That's what I expect. Yeah, there's been talk of Conor Loftus playing at number six. I'm just wondering, how has he done there? And are there any other players that have really stepped up so far? And I know it's only early days. It is. I, I, I watched Connor. I saw him playing against Sligo um, down in Ballina on the 2nd of January. I was quite surprised to see Connor playing at six. Um, uh, you know, and he's from my hometown, Cross Malina, and I know his lineage and his DNA exceptionally well. And as a minor uh, footballer, another 20 footballer, Connor Loftus was a huge, exciting prospect. I think it's fair to say most people would agree with me that he hasn't really delivered on the, that youthful promise that he had um, and that he showed back then. Um, and maybe six is a, is a place that we might find them. Obviously, we're stuck for a six, we're stuck for a three. So we've got to be experimenting there. But Conor Loftus, I know, talking to one or two of the, the, the players, his colleagues, indicated that he was playing exceptionally well in training. Uh, against Sligo, Sligo was a non-entity. I was hugely disappointed with Sligo, incidentally. Having watched them in the Tarchin Cup semi-final against Cavan, I thought, wow, these Sligo boys can play sparking football. And they did in Crow Park on that occasion. Looking at them on the 2nd of January, I said, hey, Tony McEntee, you've got some job in your hand here to get these guys moving because they just com look completely out of sorts, albeit it was the 2nd of January. But what I got um, on, uh, from that game was Mayo were streets ahead in their uh, um, athletic ability, in the preparation they had done. Will Conor Loftus be a success at six? I didn't see enough on that occasion to suggest that he will, but he, I, I suspect he'll be tried there because he's a very good um Read of the game, he's lots of experience there. And it's an interesting uh, one for sure. One we've watched with interest, yeah. Mm, Michael. John, I'm just wondering about the mood in Mayo at the moment. Um, with with Lee Keegan obviously retiring and Ushie Mullen moving away and a new management team coming in. The new management team, obviously, pressure comes with that. But is there a little bit less pressure just uh, when you go through all the personnel that are not there, all those kind of legendary names that are now gone? Like, wh what's the what are the realistic expectations of Mayo supporters? And is there a little less pressure on Kevin McStay now, maybe compared to when he stepped into the job when he had all those players available to him? Well, the one thing you know, we're talking about the, the the seismic shift in the whole approach to Gaelic football over the last number of years and how where it's moved to. The one thing we have, we've discovered as well, I've discovered. Supporters don't do patience. They want results now. And everybody wants to be in the winner's enclosure. Mayo supporters won't do patience. Uh, they look at this big management team and they're looking at this management team to deliver. They're not, they're looking to say, wow, look, I mean, we've got Donny Bucky back, we've got Stephen Ross, we've got Lee McHale there. All those guys are um, putting their shoulder to the wheel. So the focus has been um, in the early days was all on the management. I should look at, hey, how could we lose? I mean, this is what we were looking for. Look at the dream team. And I heard Porik O'Hora being interviewed yesterday at the launch of the um, Alliance National League. And to hear the excitement in his voice, I watched it on social media last night. And to hear the excitement in his voice talking about the new management team, albeit he's out injured at the moment. I saw him wearing uh, um, an ankle boot that day down in, in Balana on the 2nd of January. But, uh, there's um there's there'll always be pressure on Mayo. Mayo, like I mean, have one have one of the big teams of the country. They're in the top two or three, four in the last 10, 12, 14 years and have provided great excitement. The thing about watching Mayo, even though I'm talking about my own county, you're almost guaranteed value for money when you watch a Mayo team play. Like mm. I mean, I don't want to you know, uh, talk uh, um, poorly about you know, styles of football and looking at maybe a few teams up north who, who play that very ultra defensive side of football. Mayo don't do that. 
the play were kind of a, a reckless abandon, toe to toe, and that's why we had such sparkling games. And um, it was referred to um, in lots of uh, uh, recent weeks about uh, Jim O'Connolly and Lee Keegan because they were just awesome performances, they were awesome occasions. There is pressure on Mayo to, I mean, as I say, expectations always be high. Division one status is absolutely critical uh, for a developing team. He's got to re retain a, a division one. I mean, off to a bad start here um, at the weekend, a home game, you've got to win the four home games. So you would feel they will be safe enough. They should be safe to survive in division one. I think that's important. I think we, we certainly want, I'm not going to win a national league. I think um, a provincial title would be critical for this uh, uh, young team in transition building for the future so if it gets off to a rocky start away to our man uh, round two i wouldn't like to be in kevin's shoes but anyway <laughs> say, that's, that's the excitement w would you be fearful that galway are going to kick on to another gear again uh, after such a successful run in 2023 22. i you know funny enough i'm not so sure i am I, I am not so sure i mean the last couple of all Ireland titles in in, in uh, when you contrast it with what had went on with the previous six, seven, eight or nine all Ireland uh, titles. I think they were handy enough. I think that last year uh, was a handy enough year to win an all Ireland title. Uh, the previous year, Mayo, uh, I think it, it, people would suggest fouled up going into that um, all Ireland final against Tyrone. Everybody would have expected have been beaten Dublin. This was the year. It didn't happen for them. They underperformed alarmingly. But uh, I'm not so sure about uh, uh, Galway's critical. They're, they're like, I mean, the likes of... Comer and Walsh lose one or two one injuries. Uh, I mean, to a, a top player. Like I mean, we saw Tommy Conroy get injured, and like I mean, he weakened our team. He was such an exciting uh, direct uh, uh, forward, and uh, he's critical. He was critical to me. So if if the likes of uh, um, Shane Walsh got injured, uh, even though I saw an interview with him yesterday where he said he never felt better, he's he's you know he's mentally uh, stressed. He said, but physically he feels in great shape. No injuries, no niggling injuries. So. He'll take a rest for the National League, so this will be a little a difficult couple of weeks for, for Galway if they were to lose here at the weekend. They might be under a little bit of pressure with Six and Cup and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and the Mike Cullen boys, the Kelly's been a little bit drained after their long club season. So I'm not so sure will Galway kick on this year. I think uh, it might be a, a year to maybe to consolidate. Look, will Peter Cook come back? I don't know. He, I mean, he would certainly add weight to their... He's back on board by all accounts, yeah. He's back say, on board Peter, by all accounts, yeah. Peter Cook, like, I mean, I watched him in the club campaign, a super footballer, very, very talented. Ian Brook is back in the squad. If they were to get uh, Barley from New York, suddenly, yeah, now you're beginning to look and there's a bit of sparkle about them. But uh, no, last year, they, they, um, they surprised me in, in many ways. Um, you know, and they've got a certain a bit of momentum. But I'm not too sure will they kick on. I'm, not, I'm looking at the Derrys, I'm looking at the Armas, I'm looking at Cork, I'm looking at other teams that will drive on. And just right now, Galway for me are just a little bit below the top four or five. I could be, I could be wrong. There's a question actually in here from Richard Hogan uh, for you, John. This is a left field question, but did John encounter Gerlach Nan in his time with Clare in the early 1990s? And he does, he, does he think the footballer's success helped the hurlers break through in '95? <laughs> okay. Incidentally, I'll tell you a quick story. I was uh, I was based in, in uh, Cyprus in 1995, and uh, we had a very very su successful Irish. Uh, Hibernia Club uh, bar, uh, whatever. There was always a focus of a, uh, of attention at weekends, and we had lots of uh, nationalities: uh, Argentines, British uh, um, soldiers over there, um, Norwegian, yeah, Swedish, etc. But um, I brought over the All Ireland Finals uh, in VHF. I got on RT and I got the, the uh, tapes sent over, and we had a lot of we had some sort of a fundraiser. On a Saturday evening in the Hibernia Club and a few drinks and what have you. But uh, a lot of the English officers um, that uh, came to the club never saw hurling and they were absolutely blown away by it. And of course, it was a 1995 success. And to such an extent, they couldn't, when I told them it was amateur, 82 or 3,000 people, and this lunatic Gerlach Nan screaming on the sideline, going out, <laughs> out at half time saying we'll win the game. and. I don't know was he picking dummy teams uh, um, um, at that stage, but uh, and he did that. I, 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 I subsequently, I think when he, we, I think he named some player and, and, and whatever. But anyway, but uh, it, it was enthralling that 1995 success. Because did it have a bearing? I sure I don't know. Sure, I, I I could say yeah, of course it did. So the uh, the hurlers <laughs> would have won nothing without their hurlers. But I'm sure there was a little bit of jealousy because all the footballers on the west side of the county down there, where it was in my time. You know, of the great clubs in Dunbeg and uh, Kilmurray of Brickin and 
what have you. But um, yeah, it certainly might have helped. I mean, they're looking over the shoulder and say, well, look at hey, if Clare if Clare can do it, like I mean, Leitrim probably benefited, uh, you know, in winning their provincial title in 1994. Like I mean, they're looking at Clare if Clare can be carrying them in a provincial championship. Come on, guys, it is possible. So I would say it, it certainly might have had a bearing just on on teams just waking up and see a bit of organisation, a bit of fitness into lads, and I think it's possible. It's just about winning the confidence battle with yourselves. But uh, certainly an exciting time for Clare because Ger had been managing, I think, an under-21 team down there. And I think he got the, the, P, the P45, if I recall. Uh, things weren't going so well for him. But uh, certainly um, he got a great platform and with a great, with great squad of players in 95. Yeah. Mm, Michael? Yeah. No, did you, would you have uh, come across him much, John, while you were there or anything like that? Or... No, no, not really. Lynn Gaynor in particular, we used to share um, crocheting pitch with uh, with the hurlers. And uh, Len was ma- managing the senior hurlers at the time and uh, he's a thorough gentleman, an absolute lovely man. Uh, I, I, I might have met Gerlach Nan maybe on two or three occasions. I left in 1994. Um, my last year, Bob Clare was four years down there. And Ger more or less came in after that. So I just said hello to him on a couple of occasions. Yeah, yeah. So just uh, the, the champions of the past two years, John, uh, Kerry and Tyrone, how do you see them going this year? Huge question marks over Tyrone. I mean, that McKenna Cup final last weekend when Derry, Derry absolutely with them. I mean, I don't know what's going on in Tyrone. I mean, certainly it would appear that it's not a happy camp. I'm not suggesting that is the situation. But, you know, when you look at it from the outside, and I don't know what's going on up there, but Tyrone certainly, I won't say they're in free fall, but they have major, major issues. And that McKenna Cup final... Uh, and that result in particular certainly has put the spotlight on Derry. Derry, without the, the, the Wattie Graham players, and when they bring back, you know, Conor Glass and Bradley and a few of those guys, you, you can only imagine this could be a really exciting year for Derry. Tyrone, uh, to me, yeah, don't, not, not quite sure what's happening there. They look very, very vulnerable. Kerry, we just we mentioned it earlier. I think, I don't know, had they one defender from the, the, uh, from the uh, all Ireland. Uh, Final winning team. Uh, the, the, the two Cliffords obviously needed serious rest for a month or two. So, as, as you mentioned earlier on, I think Kerry would just amble their way through this league, survive in Divi- Division One, and have a real go again uh, at the championship. But another team to look forward to is uh, Dublin. You would imagine that they should canter their way through a Division One, uh, a, a Division Two uh, success. And they're certainly a team, you know, particularly if they get Paul Mannion back fit, which is looking likely. If they can manage to keep them fit, and the likes of Jack McCaffrey come, to be added to their squad, you'd expect that the Dubs will come with a big, big run. And, you know, uh, it'd be interesting to see Pat Garoy. I see he's taken over the Vincent Hurler. It's just been announced this week, but he's obviously there as an advisor with, um, into the Dublin camp. That's a huge boost for them as well, because I think he's highly regarded and highly respected. He's the one that really started off the whole thing back in 1995 with the Dubs. So, yeah, interesting times. Tyrone, yeah, as I said, don't know what's happening there, but certainly question marks. Just on and, Dublin, John, it looks like they're throwing the kitchen sink at trying to get their hands back on Sam Maguire, doesn't it? By all accounts, Mannion back, McCaffrey back. Like God only knows about the time that went into getting them back, because I'm sure it wasn't as quick as just making a call. I'm sure yeah. maybe James McCarthy or some of the elder statesmen had to, you know, maybe even meet the lads and then getting Pat Gilroy involved, which from a manager's point of view, from Desi Farrell's point of view, that's quite a big departure because you're bringing back, you know, someone who's won in All-Ireland in an advisory capacity. It's a sign maybe that Desi is willing to take, you know, any bit of, any advice, any bit of nuggets of information that could be clean, but it does look like the kitchen sink has been turfed at it. There's no question about it. I mean, and they will look um, last at last year's uh, uh, Kerry team that won, won that all-around. Kerry, like, I mean, there was a vulnerability about Kerry coming down the home stretch last year. And uh, Dublin will, I won't say that they, they look back with regret, but uh, I would imagine what you've just said there, Michael, is absolutely true. I think the Dubs will be a big force. And uh, Pat Giroy's addition, whatever about Jack McCaffrey and, and Paul Mannion, Dublin have a huge amount of resources available to them, player resources, but having Pat Giroy involved, and you fair, fair play to the Dublin management for getting them involved, because you know to have a guy that, with that experience and guile and know-how, and he's just a, a very, very intelligent, clever man, and you, you would imagine that uh, that's a huge coup for the, for the Dubs. But yeah, the Dubs, to me, would certainly be a number one uh, team to, to go and, and land this all in title. But as I said, it's not an exact science, but certainly they're, they're, they're headed in the right direction. 
And that's quite something that a Division Two team would be the All Ireland kind of elect. Like, and I would agree with you as well because Conor Callaghan obviously didn't play last year in the semi final either against Kerry, so that will that will change things massively. A couple of your um your neighbouring counties then, um, what's what's the mood like in, with regard to Ross Common? Like Davy Burke, we had him on the show an awful lot last year. Seems to just know the game inside out. But um, what what are your thoughts on Ross Common? Yeah, I, I felt I, I, I'm watching them in the in the dawn there. Uh, I watched that game. In, um, it was on TV or it was on streamed or something, and I watched it. And uh, I have to say, I wasn't impressed. I, and I think uh, Davy came on a little bit of um, stress and pressure after the game because of the ultra defensive style they played. I think their goalkeeper um, had more possessions than ten or eleven of his outfield players because they really did play a very lateral game, a very defensive style of game, and. Uh, they could have beaten Mayo. Like, I mean, they, I think they had 13 wides um, in that FPD encounter. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure they're going to be the, the, a big force. I think the, the Roscommon boys probably uh, are in a little bit of decline. Uh, I, I think that's a, a consensus that they have, they have uh, peaked and plateaued and there's a little bit of a decline coming. And whether it's a tough job for Davy. I just feel, had he been there maybe a couple of years ago, uh, there was a bit more um, excitement to the Roscommon threat right now. I just don't see it. The Murtas and all these boys, the Smiths, just appear to maybe have uh, played their best football. But again, time will tell. Yeah, sounds like we're not expecting a classic between Roscommon and Tyrone this weekend. Then I wouldn't. I wouldn't. No, that's not one I'd be racing to to, to 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 watch for sure. But uh, you know, you'd expect that uh, Tyrone, despite their, 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 their the issues that we perceive they may have. And despite that ugly uh, uh, encounter that took place, um, or that McKenna Cup final, like I mean, that was a huge disappointment for Tyrone. Because I know when they go out to play a McKenna Cup final, they're going out to win it. And the only the other thing I've noticed uh, in, in these uh, competitions, uh, uh, preseason competitions, and the FPT, I know Mayo for argument's sake were playing two matches. Like I mean, they'd have an A and a B or a mix, and maybe Tyrone might have, I don't know what their team, I didn't see their team selection in that McKenna Cup final, but they might be training exceptionally hard behind the scenes, getting ready for National League and trying, you know, so we can't read a whole lot into these pre competitions. But I say Mayo played Westmead up in, I think, in, in Westmead venue there a couple of weeks ago, and that evening they had another 15 out against uh, Galway as, uh, from that, I think, from that weekend. So just we don't really know what's happening behind the scenes, but I do know Mayo have a lot of pre-season work done, a lot of fitness work, and that's another thing. I know in, in Mayo, if a young fella, I know a lot of young fellas here from Castle Bar, um, um, in particular, who be contemporaries of my son, they, when they got the call up uh, to get into the squad last September, October, I mean, they burst their gut. They, they were in, into little pockets of training groups and what have you, and they started straight away. Young fellas are just mad keen to put on a Mayo jersey. That's not the situation in, at every level, down to the lower divisions. You won't get that. But I do know, having seen so the transformation in a couple of months of some of the young lads that I would be familiar with watching a club football here, just to see the strength and condition work that they, they had done in a couple of months and they had transformed themselves. So, yeah, it's a lot of good, positive work happening here in Mayo. Might take a little bit of time. And uh, uh, Donegal, then, they're at home to Kerry this weekend, but they have a lot of injuries. We talked about Kerry missing lots of players, but Shane O'Donnell, he's opted out at the moment. Ethan O'Donnell has gone travelling. There's doubts over Sean Patton. He's a guard down in, in Sligo. Yeah. Then yeah. you have injuries to Oshin Gallen, Mike and Langan, uh, Kieran Thompson as well. So it's not particularly easy for the new management there. And Michael Murphy. Mm, Michael of Murphy, God. I mean, you know, when you talk about the Lee Kegans, you talk about the big game, um, you know, the big players who have influenced the game the last number of years, Michael Murphy, number one, like, I mean, what, what, what an amazing guy. And, you know, funny enough, his dad is from out the road here in Bonnie Condon. Uh, he was, we, could, we, could have had, we could have had him down here if the father had got a transfer down to Mayo back in the day. But, uh, no, again, a, a new management, pressure in Donegal, a, a team that would appear to be in decline. And lots of their top players uh, have just gone that little bit older. And I just don't feel there's another bit of push in Donegal right now. When you look up north, you look at Ulster, you look at Derry and Armagh, and obviously Tyrone have got to be included. And I just think Donegal has slipped, has slipped down below that their level right now. And the teams come up with momentum. Donegal are not one of those teams come up with momentum right now. 
Just on that, John, it's it's a diff, it's a real difficult position for Paddy Carr, and it happens in some places. It's a lot to do with timing, I think, isn't it? When you come into a, a position like that, and all of a sudden, you know, Michael Murphy retires a couple of weeks later, um, it's you find it hard to get lads to commit. Like taking on a job, sometimes timing is nearly everything. Yeah, and and and, and I mean the optics of it. Like I mean, it, unfortunately, it reflects. You know, on Paddy, and I know Paddy's a great GM man, has done some wonderful work with club teams all over, um, up, up on the east side of the country. And, you know, as a really good oh, man, this is the job he, he so desired and wanted. And then Michael Murphy retires just a couple of weeks after his appointment. And you just say, oh, that doesn't look well. Like, I mean, yeah. I feel there was another year in Michael Murphy maybe coming off the bench. I know he's, he, I, he's got his own business and I know he's head of sport and LIT up there. But uh, notwithstanding that, it, it, there's, there's pressure in every in, in every gig, and I just feel for Paddy, um, there's going to be a big question mark over Donegal this year. I and mean, if they survive in Division One, it'll be uh, it'll be some achievement. But uh, then again, when it comes to a championship, you're always going to have you know shocks and surprises along the way. But I just don't see it with Donegal right now. Mm. Yeah, and just thinking the two boys that we've been talking about, Lee Keegan and Michael Murphy, they're both just gone thirty three in the last maybe four or five months or whatever. Like, are, are do you feel players are kind of almost forced to retire by the because of the commitments these days at earlier, I think, earlier yeah. ages? I, I I was privileged enough to play in an All Ireland uh, semi final. Um, I won't mention the year, but uh, I had uh, one of our cornerbacks uh, who I felt should have been an all star that year was 37 years of age. I'm talking about Martin Carney, uh, who played with Donegal, incidentally, he played Railway Cup with, uh, with Ulster and played with Mayo for a long number of years. An outstanding cornerback, he transformed from a forward to a, a defender, but he was 37 years of age. And we brought on a sub on that occasion late in the game, 42, a gentleman by the name of Billy, Billy Fitzpatrick, uh, at 42 years of age. He was a selector with Lee Moneed at the time. And uh, he came on as a sub in that all ahead semi final. So it just gives you an indication of where the, the whole thing has gone. A 37 year old playing into county football now would be a freak at the top level. So look at the, the, the amount of, of, uh, um, of hits got into the body right now, the, the type of, I suppose, the type of preseason training, the work that uh, players are doing. I'm sure the mental exhaustion and just Shane Ward said, hey, my body is fine. I read that uh, last night. My body feels great. But he said, I'm absolutely mentally worn to, to a thread because, you know, I think it's 23 games he's played this year. And you I mean, you look at the, you say guys are playing six a cup, having a run with the club, inter-county, and every manager is pulling them every last sinew out of their bodies to be the best they can be for, that, for their particular competition. So... Yeah, like, I mean, the chances of guys surviving into their mid-30s now, playing at the top level, few and far between. You'll get a rare exception, but it will be a rare exception. Mm -hmm. Michael, you were in Newbridge last year when Kildare beat Dublin. And one of the things at the end of the game that stood out to me is a huge flag was brought out onto the pitch by the supporters. Now, obviously, the, the players had nothing to do with that. But I was thinking they're going to pay for this down the line. And they lost in Leinster 517 to 115. Did you feel at all the county got carried away with that league performance last year? Uh yes and no. They hadn't should have hadn't beaten the dubs in so long. It was it was kind of hilarious, really, because uh, like Glenn Ryan and all the lads embraced after the game, and you could see how much it meant to them. We spoke to them ten minutes later, uh, all the media lads, and like it was like they just won an O'Burn Cup game. You know, he's trying to totally play down how how big it was, even though you could see see the importance of it. So it was. One of the big things as a result of that, Shane, is like Kildare still ended up getting relegated. Do you know what I mean? That was a win against the Dubs, but they still ended up re getting relegated. Both of them did, actually. And then when they met, it was a weird one. That They played kind of tight, kind of defensive enough football in that day in, in uh, Connellis Park. And then the Dubs absolutely opened them up. It was like, you know, just they opened apart at the scenes in Crow Park. And then they come out against Mayo, and I'm sure, John, you were at that game or would have seen it. They played ultra-defensive. They went from, like, ultra-attacking to ultra-defensive. So they were in a really weird spot where I don't I don't think they were really settled on what type of football they wanted to play. Um, and I, I think the Dubs would be a bit better tuned for this game this year, maybe, than they were for the, the previous game last year. Like, they... The dubs were so slow to get into the league last year, and it was that's what like Kerry obliterated them down in down in Tralee one one Saturday night, and obviously Kildare beat them, and they were chasing their tail and only really got going at the latter stages of the league. Where I'd expect them, like they, they're one to three favourites to win uh, Division Two, they're one to twelve to be promoted. 
you would be expecting them to get a get a result this weekend and see a, a decent few of the more familiar faces this weekend. Mm. Um, John, your your thoughts then on Division Three? We have a question in here from Eamon S. Uh, your your thoughts on Offaly's prospects in Division Three this year, starting with Antrim this weekend? Hard to, it's, it's hard to know uh, um, what's going to happen there. I think that Offaly would have benefited by uh, fulfilling their fixtures in the. Uh, the Auburn Cup, I think they should have maybe they could have gone on. Longford have won that title. It would have been a great boost to a young Offaly team. Offaly uh, um, are missing so many players from last year. Like, I mean, Niall McNamee is obviously not involved. Uh, I, I had a text message this morning from uh, uh, Jordan Hayes. He's out in the hills of Lebanon, and I think he's tuned in. So a big, a big shout out to Jordan. <laughs> uh, but uh, see, unfortunately, with, with that under-20 success that came uh, with Offaly and such a dynamic, brilliant young team, People will automatically expect Offaly, hey, I mean, the future is so bright with all of these young players coming through and what have you. But so many of them, are the, the really bright stars, uh, Cormac Geegan, you know, suffered with a really bad, bad hamstring. A lot of pressure on those young uh, fellas uh, playing games after that under-20 success. A lot of them went into club activity, underage activity, and they played a huge amount of games. A lot of them got injured. John Furlong, one of the most exciting young footballers in the country, a brilliant young fella. Hasn't I don't has played very very little football with a very serious injury. There are others. Uh, uh, um, Dunn who struggled last year as well. So it's going to take a bit of time for me. I think, think what they need is a bit of patience. Um, but I I I, I think um, hard to know Antrim this weekend. Uh, new management back in Teague and up into Antrim. You'd expect a home a home uh, result there. Like it's difficult traveling right up to to Antrim a, a away game for Offaly to start off. It's going to be difficult for them. But uh, I think if they can survive in Division Three. Uh, this year, and I expect that the will Offaly are certainly good enough, uh, good enough uh, to do that. Because uh, you know, the one thing I, 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 I had no interest to in get involved in inter-county football when I got a phone call to sit for an interview with Offaly, and I had gone to school in Carmel College Moat back in the seventies, and I was aware of the great Walsh Island team, road uh, in, in the in the picture back in those days. But it was a great tradition. I grew up watching the great Offaly teams, and the one thing about Offaly football is the heart and passion, their love they have for hurling and football. So once you have that, you have your great foundation. And I know uh, they're, they're training exceptionally hard from what I hear. I expect that Offaly survive in Division 3 with the push for promotion, possibly. But I think just there's so many players gone. Johnny Maloney, um, last year's captain, sent half back, a great lad, a fine, fine footballer. Nine Mac, big players that played up the spine of the team, gone for them. It could be a struggle for them to, to get promotion, but I expect them to survive. Just the old... Owen Rigney, Niall Darby, like there's a lot, there's so many experienced players not going to be involved, like, you know. Niall Darby, you know, what, what, what a gem of a footballer. You talk about guys and longevity in, in careers. I mean, Niall, 34 years of age, an absolutely incredible lad. I mean, you know, for me to get involved with Alfrey, the privilege was to manage the likes of a Niall Darby and a Niall McNamee. I mean, I went to school with Niall McNamee's dad and Carmel College Mort and his uncle Paul back in the day. And just to have the privilege to work with those guys. And we're talking about Niall McNamee, you know, at his age. And I just that goes against what I just said earlier on. Guys mm. playing. I mean, he, he's an amazing man. The first guy in the dressing room every evening for training. And just to have the likes of him, his presence alone, out in the pitch. And to see him mentoring and coaching the young under 21s who are coming into the setup. I mean, awfully, we, we need to be identifying him. If you're looking for a homegrown inter-county manager of the future... A Nile Derby ticket and uh, a Nile is a dream team for me. We're talking about the dream team in Mayo. That would be super for Offaly. And to have them there, with, I mean, they should have with, uh, with John Mahan as up shoulder and making sure those guys are looked after and kept on board. You could be involved uh, in an advisory capacity, John, I'd say. Well, I, I, I see I, I, the new pack, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, I was, I was walking past the main pitch in UCD the other day and Cormac Egan seemed to be moving quite well, doing a bit of a warm-up with the Fitz team. So, Michael, you'll hopefully have him fully available this year. Oh, God, yeah. Like Cormac's, Cormac's such an exciting talent. Um, and again, J John mentioned John Furlong. Like, to me, like John Furlong is a Rolls-Royce of a player. He Like, he's guaranteed starter, probably centre-back for Offaly when he gets fit, probably for a decade. Um, to me, he was actually, while... Other lads might have taken more of the limelight from that under twenty success. To yeah. me, he was the, he was the star. He was I, he was the one I thought by looking at that team. There was other names we mentioned, maybe Jack Bryant, Carl McEgan, lads that would you know 
you know, walk into a senior team. To me, he would was the first player that would start on first of them that would make a real mark at senior inter county, and he's just been affected by a lot of injuries. But hopefully, they'll clear up in time. There's a lot of exciting prospects. We like we need those three or four really big players from that team to be fit, and hopefully, um, hopefully they'll get you know get a bit of luck, and it, a lot of it will come into how they're managed, I suppose, and just making sure that they're not doing too much as well. Yeah, really. like for, for Andy McEntee, he's down, Ricky Johnson, James Laverty, Michael McCann, Thomas McCann, Connor Murray, they're all missing for different reasons. So like so many of the teams we're talking about here, like it, the job is made more difficult by the players that you don't have. And obviously retaining them is more difficult the more you go down the divisions when you're not chasing All-Ireland titles and so on. Um, For Westmead, like it's it's Desi Dolan's first year in charge. Is it a bit of a free hit, John, knowing that they've won the Talchon Cups that are guaranteed into the Sam Maguire? Not at all. Uh, uh... I have to say, um, Westmead, and we suffered a, a heavy defeat to them in the Tajan Cup, and I, they actually blew us away. I was, uh, um, they had, they had such depth and, uh, and talent in every line. Like I mean, they were a real force. Like I mean, full backs attacking, uh, a lot of talent. I, I, I think, again, it's a team I should have mentioned. I think uh, Westmead have really, really exciting prospects uh, of you know moving on. They're great. They're, they're great talent at the disposal, and. Uh, Watch them in that touch and cup final. Like I mean, they played remarkable football, and mm. you can see the love and the excitement. It was like the party, the party era coming back into Mullingar with their touch and cup victory. I saw that homecoming, and you know they have they have a great support base there, and uh, they have their demigod uh, Desi in charge. So yeah, Westmead sure. exciting for sure. They, they, they have a they have a bright bright future. Um, no question about that. Yeah, isn't it interesting seeing a couple of managers come from the Sunday game studio back out to the, the top level? Obviously, Kevin McStay has been there before, but you've Desi Dolan and Colm O'Rourke coming out at the top level. Yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, and we didn't mention Meath. Uh, I think, uh, you know, the um, O'Burn Cup was a bit of a, an eye-opener for for, uh, for Meath, certainly for us that were having a little punch, a little accumulator at the weekend, a five-year <laughs> accumulator. <laughs> Uh, I was uh, I was given out about uh, Mead on a couple of occasions. Games I might have expected them to win, but it's very much experimentation for for uh, Colum and Mead. They, they have a long road back. Uh, Mead football certainly uh, have fallen right back. And uh, you know when you think of the great teams of the Sean Boylan era and and just the the the, the, the force that Mead played with and uh, yeah, they, they, he's a difficult job. I mean every manager has a tough task, but uh, Mead are a team there where. Like, I mean, I don't think there'd be great pressure on Conor O'Rourke because he's at an age where he can handle the likes of that. But certainly, uh, you would imagine a, a Mead comeback to be competing at the top table again is going to take four, five, six years, if at all. Because, you know, you would expect population or uh, you know, the urban populations of Mead should be, uh, should be exploding. It's all about then what's happening down coaching at the, you know, down in those clubs. If you don't have the real quality involved in, in, in club football, you look at it, it's you're just hoping a cycle of footballers might come by through a freak of nature but you need that's where the investment is needed i think there's way too much money being spent at the very very top level in putting all these management teams together where there should be a greater fo focus on coaching and underage development and making sure that that's right and that's the foundation for success in the county and it might take eight 10 12 14 years and some counties have done that remarkably well and I, I just, it's something that is, it's a talking point for another occasion, but uh, that's where the investment to me is needed. Yeah, Michael, is your dog whining there in the background? I think I think he is. I think she needs to be let out, I think. I might have to, <laughs> might have to disappear for a minute, but John, you've been really good with your time. Just one, two questions I wanted to put to you. What team are you looking forward to most across the four divisions to look at? And is there any particular player that you're looking forward to seeing over the course of the league as well, or even look over the course of 2023? Yeah, I, I, I think to right now, uh, Derry have, uh, are, are, are a force, they're coming, and what they've managed to achieve, uh, Rory Gallagher, uh, as a coach, appears to be able to tweak and change and adjust his uh, philosophy more or less game on game. On occasions, he goes very, very defensive, and he, he, has, a, he has a team that certainly can, uh, can certainly uh, go places, they can play an attacking brand of football, and just looking at, at at the Glen boys, like I mean, I mean, they've they've so much quality, they've so much talent uh, at their disposal. And looking at Bradley and Connor Glass, like I mean, Connor Glass was only 
really back two seasons now. Uh, but he has transformed the whole Derry psyche up there as well. So I think Derry are the one uh, team that uh, that's really caught my eye and that are um, going to be really, really exciting. Um, just as uh, they're one, I, I'm looking forward to Westmead to see can they build on the momentum they got the Thatch and Cup. But there's so many teams that there are really like I mean my own county of Mayo here. Like I mean, it's, it's a, another team that uh, has caught my eye. And uh, if I, I, I'm going to uh, you know talking about uh, players, Matthew Ruan and Mayo here had a quiet year by his um, standards last year. I think um, the All Star uh, previous year was well justified. He's a player. He's a lad I know for a long number of years. I'm looking forward to him in, in, in this league. Can he really step up to the mark? And if he's playing midfield, which I expect he will be for Mayo, I think uh, you know a lot of pressure on, on, on Matthew to come and deliver, particularly with all those big names gone, the Lee Roy's and uh, Oshin Mullen. So we're looking for young players to step up to the up to the up to the plate. Matthew Ryan is one. Matt, good news for Mayo. Jim uh, O'Connor has to, appears to have returned to some of that good form he's displayed for years and. Uh, both of those have watched them in the um, FBD player have caught my eye. So Matthew is it just a you know, keep it local, keep it native. I'm looking forward to seeing how Matthew, uh, how Matthew plays this year. And has any club managed to tempt you back into into Surely. Uh, this year? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, you know, and, you know. Funny enough, I, I'm enjoying the, the time away from it. I I found the awfully uh, uh, traveling very very tough. To be honest with you, I found that that, that aspect of it. I love football. I love being involved. With it. I love watching football. But for me this year, um, you know, unless I do a, a session here or there with a club just for a bit of fun and just to keep myself involved. But uh, no, I'm looking forward to watching games. I'm looking forward to getting in here on Saturday evening and seeing Mayo and Galway, a bit of excitement, having fun. I often recall my times in Mayo going up on the bus on a Saturday or a Sunday up to, or a Saturday up to, up to Crow Park. You know, you see the fun and excitement that our supporters were having. And here you are sitting on the front of a bus with a team, going out to a hotel, locked up for the night and... I often kind of regret it that I wasn't out and having a crack with support as well. Right now, I can do that. And and one final thing then as well. I remember chatting to you a few years ago about managing that team, Laherdon, and yeah. the fact that it's the Titanic village because uh, proportionally it lost more people in the Titanic disaster than anywhere else in the world, which is is quite something. And there's a memorial there, isn't there? There is. There is. It's uh, it's it's literally down and down the the road for me. A lot of grief there. We've had uh, two tragedies here in the last week, um, and one poor unfortunate man still uh, searching uh, um, um, for him. He's missing. But uh, that, it's where my mother came from. I grew up uh, as a young fella, um, often hearing um, my mother talk about uh, those uh, people that were lost from the village of Lahardon. Um, I, my, that's where my mother came from. When my brother was chairman of that club down there for six or seven years, and he inveigled me to go in and take a, a session or two at the start of the season. They couldn't get anyone uh, to manage a junior team. And uh, there I was a couple of weeks later um, managing it. But I had great fun. I mean, you talk about you know, the, uh, the good memories I've had um, in football and winning a, a, an adult county junior title with Lahardon and going on to win a provincial title with them was just fantastic the excitement you get from a local club it was just i, I really bought into it and uh, i got a great bunch of lads down there and we had great fun i have to say it was an exciting time in my life and from a footballing perspective well look john as ever you've been brilliant so thank you very much for your time i, I think there's a call, welcome, coming through, a call coming through there for a manager's job i'd say john <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we just lost him there right at the end so brilliant to have him on as ever um, there's so many other teams we haven't talked about just yet, but um, Shane, we might take a little, a little, a little segue. I wouldn't mind throwing in a little quiz, and I'm going to throw it at you, but I'm going to throw it at the viewers as well. Okay, is, and is this based around league football? No, it's based around okay. hurling actually, because we obviously were, you know, we like to get in hurling wherever we can. But my question for you is this, and I want you to put all fifteen of them down, and I want okay. the viewers to do the same as well. So I want you to name. Uh, if in their positions where possible, the Tipperary starting team for the 2010 All Ireland hurling final. Oh, sure. I can just name that off the top of my head. Okay, just leave, leave it a second. Can you actually? Yeah. Okay. Just I'd like the viewers to come in here because there's a few, there's a few ones. I wonder. I wonder will they catch? I thought I, your memory is usually not the best. So we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll, look, it's Tip 2010. Yeah, we'll we'll come back to it in a second. Uh, obviously, great to have. Uh, Great to have John on there. Just an absolute fountain of knowledge. He's been involved. I think he's been involved with five different different counties. Involved with Fermanagh as well. Obviously Mayo, Clare, Offaly, 
and I think there might have been one more as well. Uh, mm. or definitely, definitely four anyway. But yeah, just uh, an absolute, uh, an absolute fountain of knowledge. Yeah, I can't wait to name the team out for you as well. <laughs> and you know, like the reason I remember Tip Twenty Ten so much is because Tip were back. Yeah, well, they were actually. To be fair, <laughs> yeah, they really were. Go on, uh, go on, horse it out do, there. Do you want me to name it? So okay. Yeah. Will I do it in the Tipperary rap that the two Johnnies did no, at the time? No, please, no. Uh, Brendan Cummins, my brother, uh, uh, Paul, um, oh, I'm going to be really Paul, Paul disappointed. Curran. I'm going to be really disappointed if you even get one position wrong. Paul Curran, uh, Mike Cahill, Declan Fanning, Conor O'Mahony, Paddy Maher, Brendan Maher, uh, Shane McGrath, Gerard Ryan. Um, oh, who was named at 11? Because I feel like Noel McGrath was wearing number 13. I'm not too I'm not too worried as long as you have the six forwards. Okay. Uh so um Lar Corbett, Owen Kelly, um Noel McGrath, John O'Brien, uh Garod Ryan, and Bonner Maher. Good man, good man. There's a couple like there's a couple of tricky ones. Garod Ryan's a tricky one, Declan Fanning at wing back. Obviously, one is one is also a full back. Even Brendan at midfield. I I probably should have known, but given it's Tipperary, I probably should have known. Yeah, someone from my own town, I wouldn't know where they were playing in that team. Come on, <laughs> come on, man. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the Fitzgibbon Cup this week. So Mary Immaculate College beat, uh, or sorry, lost to DCU two eighteen to two twenty one. I think Eddie Gibbons smashed in a late. It was either a free or, or a penalty. I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, University of Galway two twenty three, SETU Watford one thirteen. So Alex Kinnear and Jack O'Mara they scored the goals there. Twelve points from Evan Nyland. Fourteen men, uh, fourteen Galway men in the uh, University of Galway lineup. I think it was the same last year with with uh, Keen Lynch being the exception. And uh, so that means that Fintan O'Connor's Watford outfit, they need to beat MTU Cork next week to see who emerges from the three-team group. Uh, in the Sigerson this week, MTU Cork 312, ATU Sligo 27, UL 410, SETU Carlo 14. You might read out the rest of them there. Yeah, the, the, the next two are kind of mad enough. University College Cork, 19 points. Queens 310, uh, UCC 176 on penalties. And uh, Ulster University 310, UCD 7-8. Like, a, you know, like an under-12 or an under-14 result. Seven goals. Obviously, only scored one more point than the goals they got. But I didn't, like, I only saw, I saw bits and pieces of that. But, like, to score seven goals in a game of any significance is fair going. Yeah, it certainly is. And just moving down back through the uh, divisions again, I don't think we mentioned Monaghan and Armagh. So, Vinnie Corey up against uh, Kieran McGinney. Two sort of grizzled half backs there coming up against each other on the sideline. Hard to know what to expect from Monaghan because, like a few of the teams that we've talked about today, it's a case of maybe they've played their best football. Have Monaghan played their best football or, or a football, or are they going to keep producing lads who can uh, lift them up? Yeah, it's an interesting one. Um, they talk about like, grizzled, grizzled half backs, but as regards inter county experience, Kieran McGinney's absolutely dwarfs Vinnie Corey's, obviously, because he's only starting off and. Just McGinney must have this must be like his thirteenth or fourteenth year in a, in a row, is it nearly to be, in, I to think be maybe, involved? Maybe even more, yeah, involved yeah. with uh, Kildare as well. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, like, fa it's, it's fascinating from that point of view. And I think from a Wasn't it actually oh eight that they that he lost to Wicklow in his first championship match over Kildare? I think that was two thousand and eight. So that yeah. would suggest this is his fifteenth season. That's nuts, isn't it, really? Because mm. he's still, you know, a relatively young man, kind of like Davy Fitz would have went from, you know, hanging up his boots to nearly stepping into inter county management straight away. Uh, Armagh are one of those exciting ones uh, for 2023. They obviously got a big win over Donegal in the qualifiers last year. Um, lots of lads with serious potential, probably getting involved in a bit of nonsense, obviously, at times as well, which which you wouldn't like to see, even with the Tyrone game last year. I know Tyrone were deemed the, the bigger culprits, but. Uh, if they focus on their football, they could really do something here. Um, and obviously, been back, they've been in Division One. You know, staying in Division One is going to be crucial. And then, from a Monaghan point of view, I suppose not that much is expected from them. Um, um, not that much is expected from them. But 
Like you'd, be, you'd be surprised again if they don't stay up in Division One. That's just like they relegated Dublin on the last day last year. Remember Jack McCarron gave that absolutely unbelievable performance. Mm. Um, keeping him fit, keeping Conor McManus fit, obviously Conor McCarthy as well. Uh, is it Stephen O'Hanlon that used to play a bit of basketball as well? He's back involved too. Uh, the mullet, I'm sure, will be there at the edge of the, at the edge of the square. I saw him playing a few preseason games as well. Um, they still have plenty of quality. It's just. I don't know if it's because it's a managerial change. Maybe you're just, I'm not expecting that much of them this year, but they'll probably do what Monaghan do and they'll be very, very competitive. And it, again, I'd say they'll probably stay in Division 1 again. Yeah, and then uh, jump, jump into Division 2, Corker against Mead. Obviously, traditionally, they have a great rivalry, but um, if, you know it's, it's obviously not the the headline act that it used to be. But for Cork, like, it'd be interesting to see what happens with Kevin Walsh as part of the, the setup this year, coming down from Galway, which is a bit of a commute. Um, they won the McGrath Cup, but obviously Kerry aren't really, uh, you know, they're only going to be kicking into gear this weekend. Sean Powder has been o- operating at 11 so far. Don't know if he'll stay there, but you can definitely see the appeal to having him up there. Claire will meet Loud, so Colin Con- Collins, who's been mentioned already in the show, in his 10th season there, which is is some innings at this stage. David Tuberty is retired, but there, there's plenty of talent there in Clare. Uh, Louth, what's Mickey Hart's ambitions in Division 2 here? Would he like to go up to Division 1? I mean, obviously, you know, I think everyone's got aspirations of getting as high as they can, but is this the right time? Would, would Louth, How will Louth do in Division 2 here? I mean, Sam Mulroy hit 357 in last year's promotion campaign. Can he do that again, you know, a tier higher? He's obviously it's, a quality footballer. I'm looking at Division 2, and I'm looking at the two teams that came up in Limerick and Louth and promotion wouldn't be in my eyes for them anyway just mm. stay, staying up like realistically Dublin and Derry are roaring favourites probably to be promoted you have two provincial winners in Division 2 you have obviously Loud and Limerick coming up from Division 3 um, I think I think probably one of them might go, might stay up and one of them will stay down um, Loud would probably be the one I think maybe with a better chance of staying up but you know what are their what are Loud's aspirations I just think staying up um, and not regret not regressing again would be their aspirations and then obviously looking at that Derry Limerick game um, obviously Derry are going to be without the Glen players it looks like Limerick are, have come up to two divisions and are now in Division 2. Ray Dempsey, uh, after taking the reins over from Billy Lee, I was, I was just kind of thinking I'm doing a piece for Saturday's paper as well. Like, Billy Lee's shoes are so hard to fill. But, you know, they have filled them with someone who has an awful lot of experience at club level and who was, like, you know, 50-50 with Kevin McStay to be the next Mayo manager. And if Anthony Maher involved in the backroom team, there's a decent few Kerry heads in the backroom team, a couple of Limerick heads, and there's... Uh, I think he's brought another Mayo man with him as well. They were they got to the McGrath Cup final, probably didn't deliver a great performance there. I think it was at 19 points to 2-7 in that. But uh, again, staying up in Division 2, I think, for Limerick is the, the sole aim. I don't think really, outside of, you know, outside of Dublin, Derry, maybe Kildare looking at promotion, I think it's going to... And obviously, we probably underplay Clare the whole time. They've just been there since they were promoted to Division 2. I think it was in... The 2014 season that they got that they earned promotion 2014 or 2015 and just been there ever since. And David Tuberty had step away and it will leave a hole. But Colin Collins just has this unbelievable knack of finding players and bringing players through gradually and having them ready when they need to step in. And somebody's going to need to step in to take his place. Yeah, and I mentioned Sean Powder playing at 11 for Cork. Keir, uh, Keen Sheehan of Limerick, he was an all-star nomination at wing-back last year. He was playing centre-forward in the McGrath Cup final. Like some of these management teams and some of the managers coming in, they are going to have to jig things around to see if they can get something fresh. And even for, for a player, sometimes it can give you that little bit of a bounce playing in a new position. It can kind of get you excited. Uh, Division 3 then, Fermanagh against Longford. Uh, Fermanagh, in, in his first year, Kieran Donnelly, he uh, steady enough one rep- retained their place in Division Three, lost to Tyrone and Ulster, and then got to the quarter final of the Talchin Cup. Paddy Christie's hit the ground running in the O'Byrne Cup, so they've obviously lifted that. Uh, so a bit of momentum there, which is obviously very good for Paddy coming in his first year. Tip against Down. So Connor Laverty, his first match as a manager of Down is in the home of Hurling against Tipperary. <laughs> well, he's obviously had some McKenna Cup games. Um, ah, come on. They have. Um... 
they've been impressive enough in the McKenna Cup. Um, they have, yeah. Looks, looks like they have, again, and talking about Longford, I mentioned it last week, like they have the vast, vast majority of lads that should be on the Longford panel are on the Longford panel. Looks like something similar with Down. Whereas if you look at, you know, would say maybe Donegal or someone like that, you know, they don't have a lot of the players that they want. Maybe same with a Mayo or whatever, but particularly down these lower divisions, um, there's a couple, like, these are really intriguing games to kick it off. Fermanagh against Longford, like, whoever gets a win there, like, I'm, they're obviously both looking for promotion, but, like, that has massive ramifications, whoever wins there for later on in the campaign. Having two points on the board, I'd say the same for Offaly and Antrim. Like, I, I really think Offaly should be going up to Corrigan Park and getting a result. Like, Antrim are, are you know, a decent side, but... You know, they're not going up to down, which would be a much more difficult prospect. They're even going up to Fermanagh. So I'd be hoping that Offaly would get points on the board there. And if you look at Westmead and Cavan, that's obviously a repeat of the Todd Cup final from last year. Westmead came with a real flourish uh, to win it when Cavan probably had themselves in a good position before. I think it was Thomas Galligan got sent off. He's obviously not involved for 2023. Mickey Graham is still there. And... Uh, is it James Burke, the former selector under James Horn? Mm. He's a, he's involved as a coach with Cavan now, and it's amazing just the, how the pieces move to kind of different counties. And there I said, you go. yeah, I kind of said as well about when uh, the four big teams that were the four big star stood up backroom teams that were going for the Mayo job, like where would they all end up? Oshie McConville's the Wicklow manager, Ray Dempsey is the uh, Limerick manager, Paddy Christie was involved in one of them as well, wasn't he? He's the long he's the Longford manager. Do you know there's a lot it's amazing how uh, they've kind of been recirculated to different places. But the I Division One is always interesting. I think Division Two and Division Three are fascinating this year, I have to say. And particularly Division Two, which is an absolute shark tank. Yeah, if anyone out there has any um, players that they're keeping an eye out for 2023, let us know and, and we'll uh, we'll talk about it. Division 4, actually, it, just the, the final, the league finals are fixed for the weekend uh, of April 1st and 2nd. So all the Division 4 counties begin their championship the following weekend. So I'm a bit torn in terms of how seriously some teams will take it. I think most Division 4 and an awful lot of Division 3 teams, their league is their number one. But... The other part of it is, if you do want to give the championship a decent rattle, how focused would you be for the last round or two, and and certainly the final if it's the week before? Yeah, it's tricky, isn't it? Uh, it's the, at, at least they have one thing in the bag playing those finals that they're already promoted. But the idea yeah. of getting silverware in Crow, in Crow Park is like there's always such a an appeal an appeal to that. It's one thing being there and getting a run out there, but to actually win a final there is huge and. Suppose that this is one of the byproducts of the Brit season and how much how much more condensed the the league and championships are now. Yeah. Um. While we're talking about the different divisions, we might as well mention that Tipperary's Robbie Kiley he's announced his retirement from intercounty football. Only nine players remain from Tipperary's squad that fe- featured from the brilliant Munster final win a couple of years ago. Kerry FC have signed Austin Sachs goalkeeper Wayne Guthrie ahead of the League of Ireland First Division season. Uh, between May 08, so he's been on the road quite a while, uh, and October 2022, he lined out 48 occasions in the Senior County Football Championship for Austin Stacks, and only five other club players have made more championship appearances. Kieran Donaghy, Gerald Keith, Mikey Collins, Ger Power, and William Kirby. You'd expect he's going to be good under the high ball, which a lot of soccer goalkeepers tend to struggle with. To me, like is that the like basic prerequisite nearly of a keeper stop shots and be able to deal with a high ball but it's not anymore you have to be able to play football with your feet now and be like just a a distributor and able to take possession back to allow yourselves to play out from the back now i'm not saying that's the way in league of ireland but as a soccer goalkeeper in general yeah you should still be able to deal with those basic requirements but uh i don't uh i don't follow the league of ireland that closely but from what i see kerry fc seem to have made a lot of kind of interesting enough signings over the over the last over the last couple of like this is is this their first time that's the that's a new team essentially yeah it's a new team yeah yeah um so it's a mad one like if you look at those names that have more appearances for him in the than uh than guthrie like kieran donhey gerald keith mikey collins gerald power william kirby like players that have played for probably the goods of two decades for the clubs um so i think yeah. william kirby was playing till he was like late 40s or something like that i think yeah probably yeah, yeah. I, that kind that, that rings a bell i have to say um 
another interesting story, Shane, as well. We talk about Dublin and all the financial clout that they have. Uh, they're on the hunt for a new sponsor. So AIG are ending their deal in November. So the global insurance organization replaced Vodafone as Dublin's main financial backer in 2013. Uh, I don't think they'll be struggling to get a big sponsor on board. Well, I don't expect it to be a local pub or a hotel that will be sponsoring <laughs> anyway. <you know? laughs> the Golden Nugget. The Golden <laughs> Nugget got some bang for their buck out of oh, that, didn't they? They sure did. Um, Paul Meskel, uh, with his Oscar nomination, fair play to Paul Meskel, former Kildare uh, underage footballer. And um, we'll come back to one of the other hurling piece in a moment. But just to talk about Division 4, Carlo against Wicklow. So Niall Cruz, fourth season with Carlo. Oshin McConville is yet another man to step out of the punditry chair uh, and into the, I suppose, the live action here. First game in charge. And, and he said a couple of months ago, if my aim's going into Wicklow or not promotion and winning the Talchon Cup, then I might as well stay and cross because both of those are tangible for teams like Wicklow. So fair play to say to say that straight out. Wexford against London. So Kieran Dealey being involved in the backroom team at Wexford, formerly managed London and still resides there. So that's kind of an interesting one. He could he could end up on the same flight across with them. Yeah, I think he's still he's involved in like an advisory capacity, and I think he was involved in um the process in John Hegarty getting the job and even his you know assembling his backroom team and he's obviously involved there. Uh, he offers offers a lot of expertise, obviously, and uh, yeah, he's previously man he's previously managed London. He probably will have a fair bit of intel, I'd say, on a lot of the opposition that they're going to be playing in Division 4. So it adds uh, another little string to it. Um, and the other two games are Leitrim against Waterford. Obviously, Andy Moran's uh, second season with Leitrim. And uh, it's Ethan Fitzgerald second with Waterford as well. And Sligo against Leach. Like, when you're thinking about, you know, seven, eight years ago, two teams that were, you know, were not operating around there. Leach were operating up around the higher tiers. I saw them against... Mead in the O'Burn Cup, um, and they're kind of really relying on Evan O'Carroll, I'd say, and Owen, Owen Lowry up front. And you obviously have Sligo then, Tony McIntyre's side, who got to the Tarchin Cup semi final. As John said earlier, they played some pretty good football. He didn't, uh, wasn't blown away, uh, to say the least, about what, what he saw in the FBD league. So, but both it, like again, it's so important. That's a real, not necessarily a top of the table clash, but Sligo and Leash, they will, you know. It's so important to get a result at the start and try and go on from there. Whereas if you start with a loss, you can find yourself chasing your tail thereafter. Yeah, Grodo will crack on in terms of young players that uh, we'd be excited about this year. Thomas Meenahan, uh, Shane's brother, is part of Clare's football panel for the year. No, he's, he's not. He's not Meenahan. He's doing an impression of Buff. It's Meenahan, obviously. Uh, but but Buff calls him Meenahan, um, like he calls Bosang Beastings. Yeah, yeah, you got me there, uh, Grodo. <laughs> and Joseph O'Hanlon, Kerry FC are the equivalent of Athletic Bilbao, so mostly homegrown players uh, for the first division. So yeah, fair play to them, and best of luck to them this year. Um, Cody has been uh, proposed as the Kilkenny hurling captain this year. TJ Reid is vice captain. So most of the Ballyhale lads are getting a shot at being captain at this stage, given how successful they are locally. But uh, yeah, sure, I suppose it was his turn because um, most of the rest of them have had a go at this stage. Yeah, he obviously had a fantastic uh, all Ireland club final performance. Um, uh, it's going to be... Uh, now, TJ being vice captain is kind of funny, really. Like, you know, because... Uh, am I right in saying TJ has captained two teams that were beaten in all Ireland finals? He was captain in ten, wasn't he? Mm, and captain nineteen. Nineteen, yeah. Uh, and Richie Reid was as well. Yeah, Richie Reid was captain last year, wasn't he? Um, o Owen Cody's an interesting one. Uh, like I think Owen Cody has the potential to be one of the best forwards in the country, but he still he still does some things that top forwards don't do you know you know the ball in hand 45 50 yards out and you know it goes the far side might put it wider some opportunities that he just um the real clinical forwards maybe are a bit more kind of precise with but like he gets some amount of chances and gets himself into some amount of opportunities in games if he becomes an absolute killer in front of the goal in front of the post like this, he could be easily one of the best forwards in the country, and he could fill a void that's probably going to be left when TJ retires, be it at the end of this year or next year or whenever that is. Mm, he's only twenty two, um, yeah. and I wonder. And sometimes I have discussions with people. Would he? Would you prefer him closer to goal more often? I know obviously he can play further out the field, and you wouldn't always keep him inside or out. Yeah, but I I prefer him closer to goal. I just think uh, like especially when you have a good hand as well. 
being close to goal, if you if you win it in the air, you can just turn on your straight in. If I was thinking where would I play him, I'd probably play him as the third forward, inside forward, that kind of floating forward, which is kind of between the two. Um, because mm. I think he can do both. He has the hand, but he also has the eye for scores. I wouldn't I don't like him tied up inside, if you get me, too much. And sometimes you're shackled a bit in there. I'd give him a tiny bit more rain. But uh if he can hone a few things in his game, he'll be one of the best forwards in the country. Mm, okay, so I think that's pretty much it for this week, for this yeah, show. Do, do you want to fly through quickly? Who's gonna Who's going to get promoted? Uh, who's going to get promoted? Or who's going to win? Would say the four divisions. Yeah, it's so tough, but yeah, let's go for it. Let's go for it all the same. I'm gonna go for it in Division One. Uh, yeah, Division One. It's hard to know who wants to win uh, the league in a way. Well, um, with, with with the injuries for so many teams and players being out and stuff. Do you know what? I'm gonna go with Armagh. Because I'm gonna I'm gonna go with Tyrone because they expected a bounce from them. Okay, who's gonna get relegated? I'm gonna say Donny Gall and I'm gonna say Ross Common. Donny Gall and Ross Common, it would be for me <laughs> as well. I have to say, yeah, Donny Gall looked like they're behind the eight ball already, and Ross Common, like history would suggest, that they flip flopped up and down, and that is likely to happen again. Yeah, uh, Division Two, Dublin to win, handy. Dublin to win it handy enough. Um, Derry to get promoted as well. Yeah, um, I'd agree with that. And to go down, I would say Limerick and Louth. Um, it's the odds would suggest the two coming up would probably go down. I think it's yeah, Limerick Louth. I, I think I'm looking at Cork and Meath as well, and I'm wondering. Yeah, yeah, I, I I'd probably go with La- I think Louth is still up. I think Limerick will go down. One of Cork and Meath. Meath. I'm going to say Meath will go down. Okay, Division 3, who's going to win this? Um, like, Westmead are going quite well. I mean, Desi Dolan will have to hit the ground running and continue the good work of Jack um, Jack Cooney. I think Westmead will beat down in the final. I think it's between three, Westmead, Down and Cavan. Um, probably going to... Down or maybe maybe we're putting too much stock in a new manager being in Down. I'd probably go Westmead and Cavan. And to be relegated... I'm gonna go with Antrim, and don't you dare say it, Longford. Oh wow! Yeah, I thought you were gonna say Tipperary there for a second. I, I thought you. Were, I thought you were gonna say. I thought you said we were gonna say Offaly were going to get it, which I couldn't say, obviously. No, I think Antrim will go down, and I think um, it's tough. Um, I'm not. Gonna, off, no, do you know what? I'm not gonna Offaly. Say, I'm, not, I'm not gonna say Longford. Uh, and I'm going to take my Offaly hat on. They're, Antrim and Offaly are probably the two mm. most likely to go down, given the players that Offaly are missing. By the way, uh, if you're if you're out there and you've got an opinion on it as well, let us know who you think will go up and go down. Division four, then. Now this is tough. I think Watford are going to finish bottom because they're just lacking so many players. They've very little representation of the top couple of senior clubs in Watford even this year. So it's a very tough job for Effie Fitzgerald there to go up. Do you know what? I'm gonna give I'm gonna give Carlo the shout, and I'm also gonna give Leitrim the shout. Um, I'm gonna go with Leitrim. Ah, oh, this is tough. Um, very re- tough. Really tough. Uh, really, really tough. Gonna go with Leitrim and Wicklow. Leitrim and yeah. Wicklow. Wicklow were up there a couple of years ago. I. I don't know how you'd look at Division 4. Those games are so difficult to call. <clears throat> oh, uh, Down and Westmead probably saying uh, Jack Nulty. Is that to go up or go down? To go up, I'd say, yeah, somehow, yeah. <laughs> uh, Tip and Offaly will drop down to Division 4, says SSRI, looking to troll the two of us. <laughs> <laughs> he might be right. <laughs> uh, will captaincy suit uh, Owen Cody? Some lads get distracted with trying to do too much and worried about the rest of the team. Um, I can't imagine so. I think when you're that young and you have like there's a lot there's going to be a lot of leaders around him. I don't think so. And TJ is going to still be in the forward line, and Owen Cody would probably be one of the youngest lads in the forward line. So I don't, I don't think it was ever that way under Brian Cody that the captain was expected to get up and deliver big speeches or anything like that. I think he was expected to go up for the toss and collect any silverware basically and perform on the pitch. You know. Yeah, not not collecting too much silverware these days. Well, when it comes to all earning medals. 
<laughs> your lads uh so just by the way in the in the fitzgibbon cup tonight uh university of limerick against tus midwest minute university are against ucd and in the kyo cup round five coming up Meather against Kildare and Downer against Wicklow. A reminder, we've got a couple of coaching clinics coming up. We've got one in Kilworth, Cork. This is on the morning of Saturday, February the 11th, 11 a.m. Eddie Brennan, Colm Splann and Owen Brisland. So that's going to be a brilliant one. Conor Gilligan and Conor Gormley and a third special guest are going to be uh, in Derry Lochan in Tyrone on Friday, February the 10th as well. So you can buy tickets for that. If you go to the uh, video description, you'll find a link there. And then also we're brought to you by rstore.ie, which is, of course, the home of the official merchandise for our game. Michael, have we it all said or is there anything else you want to add? We have it all said, but I resent one of our viewers who said that I had a bed head. I've been up half them, so if I have a bed head, it's not because they just rolled out of bed. <laughs> Fair enough. Right, OK, we'll see you all Monday. If you want to get the audio podcast, it's going to be on patreon.com forward slash our game soon.